You're a bigger buzzkill than Buzz Killington. Have you ever been having a great time on a coaster and then, bam? <gasps> Who here likes a good story about a bridge? Ah. You're hit with a major buzzkill. This could be an ill-timed trim break, a dead portion of the ride, or anything else that just kills the thrill. I've compiled a list of 15 moments on coasters that I've ridden where the ride just dies, and it may or may not be able to recover from it. And I've ranked them from the least awful to the most awful as I look for the Buzz Killington of all coasters. <laughs> now that I've got you. These are the 15 biggest coaster buzz kills. Do any of you know the tale of how cornmeal came to be? Let's kick this off with an honorable mention, the shed on Mystic Timbers. There's a rule in the business world that says never oversell and underdeliver. If Kings Island hadn't centered their whole 2017 campaign around what's in the shed, this wouldn't have made the list. After all, Mystic Timbers itself is a ride that was undersold and overdelivered. But the shed was just a screen with a monster appearing as you turn back into the station off the final break run. The ad campaign got people excited for a drop track, a surprise inversion, or anything cool like that. But we just got a screen. The shed itself is a good idea to entertain guests on the final break run, but it was roundly criticized once people realized what it was. Number 15. Ghost Rider's Mid-Course Break Run Ghost Rider is one of the most praised wooden coasters in the country, and it's in my personal top 10. The element that makes the ride elite is the drop off the mid-course brakes and the speed you pick up there makes the finale of the ride so much more extreme with its negative and lateral forces. The mid-course brakes had to be off for this to reach its max potential, but they weren't always off. Prior to the GCI retrack in 2016, this was in place, and it was a wild card if you'd have a good trimless ride. GCI removed it as part of their retrack. But in 2018, it was added back on, so riders once again are in danger of having their second half spoiled by the train not reaching its full potential speed. The reason that this is number 15 is that I don't think I've ever felt the brakes kick in here. It's likely they did this just to create a block section for the train to perform a stop if needed, and this way they can increase capacity. I've never seen them run more than two trains, and the second train doesn't seem to ever leave the station before the first one hits the final brake run, so it doesn't seem all that necessary. But as long as it was done for capacity and not to trim the speed over the amazing drop, I'm happy with it. Number 14. The Voyage's Mid-Course Brake Run Speaking of true elite wooden coasters, here's another one that will trim your speed right before a spectacular airtime moment, this being the enclosed triple down. Holiday World does this to protect the track from excessive wear and tear in the second half of the ride. But once a year during Hollywood nights, they throw caution to the wind and turn the trims off for all of the coaster enthusiasts coming out for the event. For the rest of the year, you're stuck with the mid-course brakes. And this takes some of the thrill off the triple down as you're going down slower than you normally would. But since the mid-course is about 70 feet higher than the station, there's still plenty of speed to rip through the rest of the course on this epic ride. Number 13. Hollywood Rip Ride Rocket's Multitude of Brake Runs When a coaster gets going, it's nice to keep the good pacing throughout the course and keep the thrill going from start to finish. Universal and Maurer decided to put this X-Car model in to maximize capacity, seeing as it's located at the Universal Florida Resort where the attendance is sky high. Rip Ride Rocket can only fit 12 riders per train, but there are 7 trains. This means there has to be several block sections for all those trains to run safely. Rip Ride Rocket has not one, not two, not three, but four mid-course brake runs. If you look at the Theme Park POV's video, you can see that on a couple of these, the train came to a complete stop. Nothing says buzzkill like the train stopping every few hundred feet and starting up again. But hey, it's all about capacity and making sure that line keeps moving. Number 12, the Ride of Steel clones straight track. Hypercoasters are all about big drops, airtime hills, and maybe a nice helix finale to throw in some positive Gs. The Ride of Steel coasters at Six Flags America and Six Flags Darien Lake have this, but they're all thrown out of proportion. It's odd how it features two helices in the middle of the ride, and both of these are enormous and drawn out. But the oddest part of this coaster is the section of straight track between these two helices. It's not just a small section of straight track, it's a substantial piece of track. It takes a good four seconds for the train to clear it. The one at Darien Lake was the original, and I guess the idea there was to have it speed low to the ground right over the lake. It's not obvious what the intention was here, but for Six Flags America who doesn't have a lake, it's even weirder. 
So as you emerge from that first giant helix, instead of getting thrown into an airtime hill, you awkwardly zip through a four second section of straight track. It gets points for being different, even if it's a buzzkill. Number 11, Silver Bullet's first drop. Every ride is geared for a certain audience. You have your kids rides, your family rides, your intermediate thrill rides, and your high thrill rides. B&M inverts fall squarely into the category of high thrill rides. Most of them have a steep twisting drop. Think Montu, Raptor, and for one that will really knock your socks off, check out Banshee. Silver Bullet kicks off its course with a 40 degree drop. That's a full 11 degrees more shallow than Ghost Riders and 21 degrees worse than Goliath at Magic Mountain. It's a nice gradual way to build up speed and complete the rest of its very solid course. No stomach dropping feeling like on Raptor and no violently getting ripped over the edge like on Banshee. Just a nice glide into the first loop. Knott's had to do this because of its space limitations, so at least it's not a mystery, but it doesn't make it good. When you disembark from the lift hill, you expect the ride to start with a bang, but this starts with a whimper, buzz kill. Number 10, Leviathan's giant final break run. This B&M Giga was the first of its kind when it debuted in 2012, and despite its 5,400 feet of track, it still feels like a bit of a short ride. One of the reasons for this may be the fact that its brake run is over 500 feet long. That's right, the brake run is 509 feet long, and it starts so high off the ground. Leviathan has a solid L-shaped layout and over a mile of track, but it ends so abruptly, and it seems like there could have been so much more done with the remainder of the space that they had. But ending the ride that far from the station, that high off the ground, and you glide on that straight track and just ease on a steady decline to the station, it's quite the anticlimactic way to end the ride. Number 9. Wicked Cyclone's Third Lap This RMC hybrid is comparable to Twisted Cyclone in terms of the size and layout of the original coaster that formed the structure that RMC had to work with. Wicked Cyclone is 9 feet taller, but has almost 1,000 more feet of track because it has a third lap that Twisted Cyclone does not. Even though Wicked Cyclone has a brilliant layout that places it among the top tier of RMCs on my personal list, it doesn't have enough gusto to make that final lap really pop. Other than the final inversion, the final lap just crawls along and there's no airtime as it finds its way back to the station. For such a great ride for the first two laps, that third one is a buzzkill because it definitely ends with a whimper. Number 8. Twisted Colossus's second lift hill. RMC makes its way back onto this list. This time it has nothing to do with pacing issues. After the first 30 seconds of the ride where you get world-class airtime on the blue track, the train switches over to the green side and the adrenaline that you had from the blue side wears off as you crawl up that lift hill. Even if the trains have no chance of dueling each other, that green lift takes forever to get to the top. It runs much slower than the blue side by design, so the blue side has time to catch up and the trains can duel. Some people say they like the break between the two action-packed sides, but for me, the long delay between the action is a buzzkill. Not much that the park or RMC could have done about it, and I'm definitely not complaining about being able to ride both sides without having to choose, but the long break in the action is a flaw in my opinion. Number 7. Iron Rattler's Slow Quarry Crawl Sorry RMC, I gotta get you one more time. And this one is about pacing. Iron Rattler starts and ends with a bang, with a 171 foot double twisting drop that I think is the best drop on any RMC out there. And then a dive off the quarry wall that will chuck you out of your seat, especially if you're in the back row, better than just about any coaster out there. But to get on top of that quarry, the ride has to spend a lot of its speed. After a fast paced first half, Iron Rattler enters its zero G roll and lands on top of the quarry. It does a lap around the quarry with airtime hills and a mini wave turn and a mini outer bank turn, but the train is absolutely crawling at this point. After such a fast paced first half and knowing how the ride ends with fury, that time on top of the quarry seems kind of pointless and out of place. And it's something that you just kind of have to get through between the legendary start and the legendary finish. Number six, Goliath's mid course break run. This hyper twister at Magic Mountain is known for its bone crushing helix finale. And the faster the train is going, the more likely you are to gray out. The park knows this, and to make the helix less intense, that mid-course brake run is strong. The train will sometimes come to a complete stop before it crawls off of it in order to wind back down to the helix. I understand the park doesn't want people blacking out on their coasters, but having a coaster come to a virtual stop right in the middle kills the thrill and definitely qualifies it for this list of buzz kills. This would probably be higher if there was any thrill before or after the brake run, but Goliath just falls flat all the way around. And just a side note, it's crazy that there aren't any really good traditional hypers west of Chicago. Goliath, Titan, Desperado, Mamba, Wild Thing, the west just does not know how to do hypers. Number 5. 
The Chain Lift Finales on Ninja and Adventure Express Some people will tell you that they love coasters with a slow chain lift because it builds up that anticipation. And I would tend to agree. I don't mind a good long lift hill where I can enjoy the ride and take in the sights. But for Ninja at Magic Mountain and Adventure Express at Kings Island, the ride ends with a lift hill. These terrain coasters start high on a hill and they work their way to the bottom, but need a boost to get back to the station. This is accomplished with a chain lift, and I'm not sure everyone on the train realizes that at the end of that lift, there is the station. Get out. This is especially prevalent with Adventure Express, which has a pretty dramatic enclosed lift just to drop you right back into the station. That's why by the time the ride ops asked the riders how the ride was, nobody is pumped up anymore. Rides that end with lift hills are major buzzkills. They need to take a page out of Silver Dollar City's playbook with Thunderation, where it does need to climb back into the station, but there's still a little bit more ride time afterward. Number four, the trims on B&M Hypers. B&M makes their hypers with large parabolic camelbacks that deliver fantastic floater airtime as you fly over the top. But sometimes, as you're climbing that hill about to hit the crest, you hear that dreaded sound of the trim brakes. It sounds like air coming out of a balloon, and you feel the train lose some speed. This is especially painful for riders in the front since they won't be getting that airtime on top of the hill. But riders in the back can still salvage some good airtime. But if you're riding a B&M Hyper anywhere except for the back, seriously, what are you doing? Raging Bull, Intimidator, Diamondback. These are all notable violators of this buzzkill. Behemoth has a trim brake on all three camelbacks after the hammerhead. Turn the brakes off. Let the riders fly. Number three, the trim brake after Maverick's second launch. Maverick is a rapid fire, low to the ground, intense coaster with lots of great elements. The second half starts with a bang as it launches you into the coaster's top speed of 70 miles per hour, into a left-hand turn, and up into a harsh set of trim brakes before swooping down through its S-bend and into the Stangle Dive. The airtime that you would get over that hill into the dive would be incredible, but a lot of that 70 miles per hour that you just picked up gets lost with those trims. Imagine this coaster with no trims and the Heartline roll still in place. Not sure that would be safe, but I'd still like to see it. For a coaster that's so fast and furious, this trim brake is out of place for Maverick, and it kills the buzz off that launch out of the tunnel. Number two, the trim brake on Intimidator 305. This Intamin Giga is defined by speed and intensity. After a 300 foot drop, it tries to knock you out with an incredible high g-force 270 degree turn, and then up over a large hill that's so big that it loses enough speed at the top to make the airtime pretty much non-existent. It dives back to the ground where it twists and turns, and then you see it. You're gonna go flying into an airtime hill, and then you feel it, the trims. These are absolute killers. It completely takes away any bit of airtime that you may have gotten over that hill, or the next one that dives down to the right. I've heard that these were put in to make the last few turns of the ride less intense. And I would believe it if they just didn't want to put that much stress on the upstop wheels as the train flies over those hills. But regardless, for an airtime junkie like me, riding a coaster that was in no way designed for my personal taste in coasters, seeing a potential airtime moment killed by a trim brake is a major buzzkill. Number one, the brakes on the final drop of Full Throttle. Full Throttle is an extreme and unique coaster at Six Flags Magic Mountain manufactured by Premier Rides for the 2013 season. Even though it's short, it featured the world's largest loop at the time, a backwards launch out of a tunnel, and it's still the only coaster that goes under and on top of a loop on the same circuit. This final drop off the top of the loop is amazing. You get absolutely flung out of your seat regardless of what row you're in, but especially in the back. But the number one buzzkill on this list is the fact that there are brakes on the final drop, not even right after it, on it. In the back row, you feel yourself slowing down as you're still facing straight down. In the front, the airtime is less strong, but you actually get to feel more of that drop before the brakes fully kick in, sadly making this actually more enjoyable in the front. It would have been so nice for the park just to give it a couple overbank turns at least. Maybe one that went through the loop before turning back into the station. Just so it could do something with all that speed over the final drop. But the reason this is number one is because it couldn't even wait for the drop to finish before slowing you down. And this is the Buzz Killington of all coaster elements. That's it for this list of buzz kills. Let me know where you agree or disagree with this list and what other buzz kills you've experienced. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you all next time.